Lord Raglan's work presented the mythical hero in a very much ahistorical context, and did not deem it necessary to examine the myth in other ways except as part of ritual and drama. Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces presents a much more convincing examination of the nature of myth, albeit again through a flawed approach which is mainly via a social and psychological point of view. In respect to Frank Herbert, and especially his keen interest in psychology, it is likely to suggest that Campbell's work had much more appeal to him as an author and avid researcher, though to go from Raglan to Young to Campbell in this type of study of the hero is a logical progression. It is also worth mentioning that a resurgence of interest in Campbell's work had materialised through the cinematic event that became the Star Wars phenomenon. George Lucas's Star Wars franchise was considered to be a work that borrowed heavily from Frank Herbert's Dune, amongst other science fiction books, as well as movies such as Akira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. What is of particular interest is that Lucas often cited the same original source of inspiration for constructing his space opera monomyth, namely that of Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. When Dad saw the movie, Star Wars, he picked out 16 points of what he called absolute identity between his book and the movie, enough to make him livid. He thought he saw the ideas of other science fiction writers on the screen as well, including those of Isaac Asimov, Larry Niven, Ted Sturgeon, Barry Malzberg, and Jerry Pornell. Still, Frank Herbert tried to be upbeat. He and other science fiction writers who thought they saw their work in Lucas's movie formed a loose organisation that my father called, with his tongue firmly placed in his cheek, the We're Too Big to Sue George Lucas Society. Through humour, Dad tried to mask the pain. Perhaps the fact that both Lucas and Herbert were trying to embed universal myths within their work, in order to create a ubiquitous set of themes and characters that certainly in the case of Star Wars, would appeal to a mass audience, meant that the reasons for this absolute identity were lost on Frank Herbert. If indeed both works are composed around creating universal myths which follow a certain pattern, there is little doubt to expect a wide number of similarities. As such, if myths contain universal elements, I prefer to consider comparative mythology or mythemes rather than a concept of a monomyth, then similarities between Dune and Star Wars are no different than for example the many similarities between Beowulf and the Epic of Gilgamesh, even though many centuries separate the works. What is clear is that both Lucas and Herbert had been enthralled by Campbell's work on the monomyth, in discussing the concept of the monomyth, Joseph Campbell describes the role of mythology as follows. It has always been the prime function of mythology and right to supply the symbols that carry the human spirit forward, in counteraction to those other constant human fantasies that tend to tie it back. Campbell's concept of the monomyth, like Lord Raglan's, sees the hero's adventure take him through a number of universal stages in his quest, in this case, 17 in total. These 17 key areas fall into three main categories, which are as follows. Stage 1 is the departure and features five steps. The call to adventure, refusal of the call, supernatural aid, the crossing of the first threshold, and the belly of the whale. Stage 2 is the initiation, and features six parts. The road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, Woman as Temptress, Atonement with the Father, Apotheosis, and the Ultimate Boon. Stage 3 is the Return and has six steps. The Refusal of the Return, the Magic Flight, Rescue from Without, the Crossing of the Return Threshold, Master of the Two Worlds, and Freedom to Live. What is fundamental to the concept of the monomyth is that all forms of mythology, whatever their social, religious, cultural or chronological context in which they have evolved, share a common ancestry to the human psyche. The question that Campbell asks is, why is mythology everywhere the same, beneath its varieties of costume, and what does it teach? Campbell's ideas are inextricably linked to the fields of psychology and psychoanalysis, in particular the works of those such as Freud, 
but it is especially the influence of Carl Gustav Jung that can be found within his work. The ancient myths as he sees it are alive today and influencing us in our daily lives through our subconscious, carried forward by a form of race memory or collective unconsciousness. This idea is in much the same manner as Jung's notions of the collective unconscious as the ideas put forward about evolution by Samuel Butler discussed in the previous chapter. The concept of the monomyth was taken by Campbell from James Joyce's novel Finnegan's Wake. The normal route that the hero takes according to Campbell was that which derived from the rites of passage, separation, initiation, return, which might be named the nuclear unit of the monomyth. The rite of passage sees the hero set forth on his journey where he overcomes certain tasks or obstacles in a world that is usually to some degree supernatural, before returning to the world he left with new powers which he is able to use to help his fellow man. Whether this is in a mythological context, which Campbell sees as a representation of the macrocosmical triumph of the hero, or in fairy tales, which tend to be more microcosmical in their achievements, the monomyth has a pervasive universality to all cultures of humanity, which is fundamental to our hopes, fears, history, and sense of future. The two, the hero and his ultimate god, that seeker and the found, are thus understood as the outside and inside of a single, self mirrored mystery, which is identical with the mystery of the manifest world. The great deed of the supreme hero is to come to the knowledge of this unity in multiplicity and then to make it known. Raglan, Young, and Campbell's work are, however, representative of what Robert Graves called the process of iconotropy, which is where the myth has been either deliberately or accidentally misinterpreted. The correct approach to myth is much as Graves states, relying on archaeological evidence as a reliable guide to understanding, and if this is not available, then the historical and anthropological approach would seem best. Ultimately, these endeavours at mythography fail to attempt such an approach, and simply contain wild speculations backed up by bizarre theories, which stem more from these individuals' own beliefs, rather than any proper attempt to understand the archaic traditions, cultures, and civilizations that spawned such heroes and myths. In looking at the myths and legends that span the globe throughout the ages, we can see a wide variance of ideas, rites, traditions and religions, many of which are unique and lend themselves to distinct cultural flavours of their specific regions. In fact, the works of these men are fundamentally orientated, with few exceptions, to the myths and legends of the Western world, without undertaking a detailed approach to the idiosyncratic nature of more distant and ancient cultures. Herbert in his own way does make an attempt to successfully blend various ideas of religion, culture and myth in Dune, and although there is much in the nature of western myth and legend within the work, we also see successful representations of a number of historical, linguistic, mythological, cultural and religious tropes within the Dune series. Basing his concept of the hero on the works of Lord Raglan, Young and Campbell, Frank Herbert's attitude towards the hero is twofold, and to a certain extent almost schizophrenic. To Herbert, the hero and the superhero that successfully follows the flamboyant Camelot pattern is a fundamentally dangerous entity for the society that follows him. This hero can be religious, militaristic or political in their outlook and background, and it is when the masses begin to follow larger than life heroes such as these that there exists the potential for a great deal of damage to be inflicted upon society. Simultaneously, Herbert is also using the concept of the monomythical hero and his mythological quest to provide a universally recognisable framework for his story in Dune. Even though the first part of Dune sets up the structure presented in Raglan's Ritualistic Steps and Campbell's monomyth, that of separation, initiation and return of the hero, he will then have his hero become utterly destructive to the societies of the Empire, and most especially to those who follow him blindly, his own adoptive people, the Fremen. The hero can be bad for society, of this there in a sense can be little doubt, 
though it is certainly not always the case. Herbert preferred to look at the bigger picture in life, especially in his ideas of ecology, and in this case, it seemed he was unable to look to the end of his hero's actions. If Hitler was a so called hero to Nazi Germany, his actions were destructive not only to his enemies, but especially to his own people. Hence, in this aspect, Herbert's attitude to the hero is proven correct. But against this, if we look at Campbell's view that the actions of Hitler as a hero bring about the death and destruction of a certain culture or society, then this represents the symbolic deficiency that exists in the world of the hero. The death process is ultimately part of the common symbolism of the monomyth, and is required for rebirth. In other words, sometimes these dangerous heroes, who are destructive for society, ultimately benefit mankind in the long run by bringing about a process of renewal after the destruction they cause. The composite hero of the monomyth is a personage of exceptional gifts. Frequently, he is honoured by this society, frequently unrecognised or disdained. He and or the world in which he finds himself suffers from a symbolic deficiency. In fairy tales this might be as slight as the lack of a certain golden ring, whereas in apocalyptic vision, the physical and spiritual life of the whole earth can be represented as fallen or on the point of falling into ruin. Donald E. Palumbo, in his examination of chaos theory within Frank Herbert's Dune, sees the monomyth as echoing and bolstering the chaotic fractal patterns that appear in an ecological context in Dune. He examines this in two chapters which are an interesting take on the idea of the monomyth within the Dune series. There are indeed possibilities here, as there can be seen an identity with Campbell's visual representation of the monomyth with Jungian mandalas, and even Herbert's map of Arrakis. Palumbo argues that the monomyth itself is intrinsically and thoroughly fractal, and as both it and its component elements recur in each novel in the series, demonstrates the series' fractal self-similarity across the same scale, volume after volume. Ultimately, in presenting us with a future mythology in Dune, and showing us his own version of a far-flung monomyth, Herbert is asking us some deep-seated questions. The concept of the hero being bad for society allows Herbert in presenting this key theme in Dune to hide within the text another major theme, that of ecology, which I will examine in the following chapter. At the same time, having studied the nature of myths from the likes of Campbell and Raglan, he is successfully able to create a blend of cultures, religions, philosophies and languages in Dune, which lend a sense of verisimilitude to his universe not often found in science fiction. In taking science fiction as a genre, and by successfully presenting it in a more didactic and literary form, in combination with his own concepts, Herbert is able to, like Campbell, ask us quite simply and without imposing his own ideas upon us, a simple question. What does this teach us?